I wanted to uh, share this, this message with you. Uh, I'll give you some details here in just a second. But Dad shared about, uh, about, how to, about guarding your heart. And so that's going to be the series today is Guard Your Heart. Now, uh, we weren't here a couple of weeks ago. We weren't here for, I think, his second message, which we were online watching with you. Uh, we stayed home. We, ha- we looked it up. I looked it up. Uh, Amy and I had not missed a Sunday in 58 weeks. And so we just needed a Sunday. We, just, we didn't even we didn't leave the house. We stayed home. We're not out of town, didn't go nowhere, don't stay in the hotel. We stayed at home. We had a staycation on a Sunday morning. That's when I ripped the wall out. We were watching Jesus on YouTube or on the, on the YouTube channel, and we were tearing out walls in the house. That's what we were doing two weeks ago. And I'm going to tell you what, I miss my church family. I enjoyed it in the moment, but I'm like, man, it feels like I've been six weeks since I've been here. I don't know how anybody misses more than a week at a time. I'm just telling you, it, it tore me up to miss a week, but we needed it. We took that time down. 58 weeks is a long time to be here every single week, even though I didn't preach every one of those. And so it was an awesome time for us to have that break, but now we're ready to go. And I want to just share this word with you because God's laid it so heavy on my heart. And I think it's in a season that we're in that we really need to hear this. We really need to know what God is doing in the, in the, in the world around us. But, but more important than that, what's he doing on the inside of us? And so I want to go to the scripture that he laid the foundation with in, in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. It says, my son, pay attention to what I say and turn your ear to my words. In other words, and, and again, Dad shared this with you, but I just want to say it again. He said, I want you to look at me and listen to me. If you have a kid, you know what I'm talking about. I'm, 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 I'm hearing you. You ain't, you ain't looking at me. You're looking in your phone. You ain't even turned my way, and you're supposed to be hearing me. You ain't hearing me, and if you are hearing me, it sure don't look like you're hearing me. Anybody got a kid like that? They, oh, yeah, I know what you're saying. No, put the phone down. Pick your head up. Look, look eye to eye. I want you to know that I'm saying this, and I want to know that you know that I know that you know that I know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, want, you, I want to know that you're paying attention to me. And I, do that, I still do that with my kids sometimes. Just like, like okay, look, look at me. Like, I want to know that you're hearing me. He's saying, like, pay attention. Let's just put the phone down for a second. Turn the computer off. Turn the TV off. Uh, stop the conversation. For, just look at me for a second and hear what I'm saying. Pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear towards my words. Let them not depart out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Now, I want to say this real quick about this passage. You can't have one without the other. See, he's saying keep it in your heart, but you won't keep it in your heart unless you don't get it. If, unless, if it leaves your sight, it won't be in your heart. So he says if you want it in your heart, you got to keep it in front of you. In fact, the Old Covenant... Uh, Old Testament, he would say, write on a, on, on a doorpost. I mean, write it on some things. Write it on your arm. Write it on a piece of paper. Read it when you're walking down the street. Read it when you're, when you're laying down with your kids at night to put them to bed, while you're eating lunch, wherever you're at. Keep it in front of you, and there's no reason you can't keep that in front of you with a cell phone today. There's no reason we can't have the Word of God always in front of us. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep it around you. If you will do that, it will be in your heart. So he says that. Keep it in your heart. That's important. For they are life to those that find them and health to one's whole body. Now, let me say this about this scripture. Um, it won't do you any good until you find them. They are life to those who find them. And I know people, and you know people that like to quote scripture, and they have no clue what they're talking about. Just a little snippet of a scripture that take it out of context. Or, or, or I mean, even Jeremiah 33, uh, uh, what is it, 33, 3? That ain't 33, 3. 29, 11. I mean, that has been taken out of context. There's a lot of scriptures that we say, oh, well, God doesn't mind. He wants me to follow my heart. That's the dumbest thing you could ever hear. Don't, please don't tell your kids that follow your heart. You know what the Bible says about your heart? It's deceitfully wicked above all else. And people say, well, God just wants me to be happy. Well, he wants to be happy too, and he's happy when you make him happy, when you honor him or what you do and say. He wants you to be happy, but he wants you to be happy in him. So a lot of times we take these scriptures and we, and we, we make them say what we want to say. He says, I want you to find the scriptures the way I said them, the, the way that I worded them, in context. It allows us to find them in health to one's whole body. And then here's what he says. Here's what we'll get our, our, our series out of. Above all else, the A number one important thing to do is to guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. You know what the word everything means? means every stuff. Every conversation, every place that you go, everything that you do, everything that you say, uh, every, every habit that you have, uh, everything that's about your life, everything that you do flows out of your heart. And you know those people, I know those people, some people can hide their emotions and some people can't. Uh, you don't have to wonder if your kid likes the gift you gave them when they're seven years old that you already know. 
my wife, she can't hide her feelings. So when I get her a present and she don't really like it, she's like, hey, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, here's a receipt. Take it on back. I give her cash money now, Troy. That's what I do. Ain't a lot of thought goes into it, but I don't have to take it back to the store. It's just well, she can go get whatever she wants. But some, you can't hide, like it's going to come out. Whatever's on the inside is going to come out. He says, I want you to guard your heart. I want you to guard your heart. So, God, so we had this, this illustration I want to show you that we had this last week, uh, two weeks ago, and I actually showed it for two weeks. And I want to show it one more time very quickly. But it's the, it's the heart, and your heart is your soul and your spirit together. And so Dad did a great job explaining this. But your, your heart is your soul and your spirit together, and your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's what your soul is. Now, I'm going to take just a second and talk about temperaments just for a moment. If you don't know this, you're one of four temperaments, and you have a primary and a secondary. If you go through growth track, you'll take what we call the DISC test. You'll be D and I and S or C, all right? And so that, that's, that's one way to do it. But we, I call them what we used to call them, which is uh, the, four, the four names, which is phlegmatic, melancholy, choleric, and sanguine. So, so, so you're one of these four, and, and there ain't no getting around it. You ain't special. Like, you're one of these four. You ain't off in left field somewhere. You're one of these four. And you have a primary and a secondary. And so what happens is if you are a melancholy, everything that you do is filtered through your mind. Like, like, you overthink things. Like, like if you're going to buy a chair, it'll take you six months to make that decision. Because you, you research, and you research, and you research, and you find a sale, and you do some more research, and you realize there was one bad review out of 16,000, so you don't get it. You just overthink, overthink, overthink. So that's a, that's a melancholy. They're usually, um, they're usually uh, very artistic. They're usually um, musicians. So, so, so they, they use their mind a lot. The will is the choleric. So if you're choleric, you're just very dominating. You just... What you say goes, it goes when you say it goes, it goes how you say it goes. And if somebody says jump, I mean, you say jump, and then, you know, it's the whole how high thing. Like, that's you. You, are, you dominate conversations usually. Uh, saying ones do a lot too, but, but, a, but a choleric, man, they, they pretty much dominate in every area of their life. You want these people running teams, but they need a little grace too. So you need to team up with somebody who's got some grace because usually clerics don't always have a lot of grace because it's about getting the job done, period. You usually don't want a choleric paint in your house. I say that all the time. Because they're a checklist-making son of a gun. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it ain't about not getting on the ceiling. It's about finishing the room. You don't want a choleric paint. I'm just telling you. Like, they do great with the roller. Like, they see some process, progress, but you want to do the trim on a house. I'm just, don't, I'm just telling you right now, a choleric, they're so, they're so uh, list-driven that they will do that. So they are, they are actually, the wheel is a big part. So everything that they do filters through the wheel. They're going to get it done. They're going to fight through. They're going to make it happen. And then you have the sanguine, which I want to talk about today, and they filter everything through the emotions. So a sanguine is usually, they got super high highs and really low lows. And it ain't just because it's your wife. Like, it ain't just a female thing. It ain't just a, a crazy male thing. Like, it is a sanguine. So if you've got really high highs and really low lows, you're probably a sanguine. You filter everything through the emotions. Now, there's one more that we didn't really talk about, and that's a phlegmatic. And that's what I am. And a phlegmatic is a pretty good blend of all three. And we have, if you have pros and cons, we have the shortest uh, cons in the biggest list of pros. We're the best temperament that you can ever imagine. But let me just tell you, the cons are really bad. All right? Like, we're super stubborn. Uh, we, we don't always give in. We very rarely say, I'm sorry, except for me. Ask my wife. She'll tell you that I say it at least once a year, at least. And that's more times that I'm wrong. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying it just to get through the argument. But a phlegmatic has a good blend. But if, you're, if you're, you have a secondary, so I'm phleg male, so this is my secondary, so, so I tend to filter things through my mind more than anything else. All right? So if you want to know what you are, go through Growth Track. You can do it online. You'll find out if you're a DISC, and you can find out which one you are on here. But here's what I'm going to tell you. God showed me. I was mowing the other day, and I wasn't even thinking about it. And this, this image came into my mind that, that Megan had created for Dad's messages that he preached. And, and when, he, when I saw this in my spirit, I really realized that there are three primary spirits that are controlling our world, and especially the United States right now. And every one of them is dominated in one of the three. 
So the one I'm going to talk about today is in the emotion. So this is a spirit that dominates your emotions. This is, if this spirit is on you, it's because you're an emotional person. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be a, a, a sane one to do it. We all have emotions. We all get jacked up about stuff. Some things you, you get really excited about. Some things don't really bother you that much. Maybe you're a political person. That stuff really excites you. But some other stuff don't really bother you that much. But listen, if you're a sane one, it's specifically true, but we all have to deal with this. And the spirit that I want to talk about today is a spirit of offense. It's what's been called the bait of Satan. He baits you in, he gets you offended, and it will jack up your life. You will, you will spend all your time trying to figure out how to make somebody pay for what they said, what they did, uh, what they said about you. Um, something, and, and the other thing about offense, let me just say real quickly, is sometimes we get offended because of what person A said about person B, and we're person C. We had nothing to do with it. That is a dangerous place to be because you cannot give or receive forgiveness for somebody else's issues. And let me just tell you, that's all social media is about. Come on, y'all got to help me out better than this. That's all social media is about. It's about you getting ticked off about what A did to B, and you're over here in C, and you can't do anything. You can't receive or give forgiveness, and you are jacked up about it. And we live that way. And what happens is we get drawn in and sucked in. All of a sudden, we're just living for it. We're looking for something to get mad about. But I'm just telling you, God doesn't want us to live that way. He doesn't want us to live that way. In fact, here's how he wants us to live. It says in Psalms 133.1, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And and here's what it does. Here's what happens. When we live in unity, here's what happens. Look at verse 2. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down Aaron's beard, down the collar of his robe. There is an anointing when there's unity. And guess what? uh, There's no anointing where there's no unity. Where there's disunity, there's no anointing. God cannot bless a church that's not united. There's no anointing on it. Listen, we have to be united. And I don't mean go lock arms and go stand on a, in a protest somewhere. I'm saying like, we have to be on the same page, going the same direction at the same speed at the same time. We have got to be united. It's so powerful if we will get united. Now, if we're going to be united, we've got to understand something here. Uh, if we're going to be united, we're going to have to start living with some people that we don't really like. We're going to have to start treating them a little better than we're treating them. In fact, Hebrews says it like this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says this. Work at living in peace with everyone. You know what everyone means? Everybody. Everybody? If you're a Republican, that means Democrats. If you're a Democrat, that means Republicans. Are y'all hearing this this morning? I know this ain't easy to receive, but I just want to tell you, we have got to work at this, work at living. He said it ain't going to be easy. He said just go start living peaceably with all men. No, he says you got to work at it. In fact, one version says make every effort. And let me just rephrase that and say make an effort. He said make every effort. I'm just saying make an effort. Just try it. Just next time you go to make that comment on social media, just stop typing. Delete, 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 delete. You know how many times I've done that? More times than I want to confess to you, I've deleted a comment that I started to type, and it was a good comment, too. (laughs) And it was accurate, and it felt good. Most of all, it was going to create more issues. Because responding to error only creates more error. I'm going to say that again. Responding to error only creates more error. He says, I want you to work at living with peace with every one. And I know you're like me. You got, I got, the other day I saw a friend of mine and I, some, somehow popped up and said they had like, like 900 friends. I was like, 900 friends on social media? That's crazy. So like, I wonder how many friends I got. 1,100 friends. I know 33. <laughs> See, <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? I can make an impact. Now, Mark Zuckerberg not, may not let all my stuff, everybody see all my stuff, but I have the potential to make an impact on 1,100 people in a positive way every single day if I want to. Or I can offend some people if I want to. Now, am I telling you to walk around with just sugar-coated, act like nothing's wrong? No, I'm just saying let's work at it. Let's, let's try it for a minute. Let's see what happens when we start loving people and stop getting offended about every little thing that pops up. And what I have found is uh, I have found that the videos that pop up on my YouTube channel, uh, they start popping up, and they're, they're stuff that I agree with. 
It just fuels me. Yeah, I'm right. I'm right. We're right. We're right. And whatever you agree with, if it's different than mine, it starts popping up and it gets you jacked up. And all of a sudden, you have an opinion about stuff you don't know nothing about because of videos that you saw about somebody you don't even know talking about something you don't care about. It's just a cycle. I had to break that cycle. I had to get off of social media. And I cre- I'm creeping back on slowly. So, so I'm, you know, I'm just real slowly. But as soon as I get on, I see something like, oh, that's why I got off right there. He said, I want you to work it. I want you to, let's, let's do a little test run. Do a seven-day trial period. Just try working a piece of everyone. Work to live a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. In other words, you may be the only Jesus that they see. And whatever you post on social media, and however you respond to people in person is going to dictate whether they see Jesus or not. I know that's some weight, and you probably don't want it, but it's on you. If you're a Christ follower today, you've got to wait on you to show Jesus love no matter what's going on around you. I'm going to say that again. If you're a Christ follower, you have the weight of showing Jesus' love no matter what's going on around you. Doesn't matter if that referee saw or didn't see that foul. Doesn't matter if the coach didn't play your kid enough. That stuff, we got we to gotta realize that it's bigger than that, y'all. It's bigger. The spirit of offense is running rampant. And he says, you got to live a holy life because other people are watching you as you follow Jesus. Look at the next verse. Look after each other. I'm responsible for you, not just because I'm your pastor. I'm responsible for you as a Christian, as a Christ follower. I'm responsible for you. I'm supposed to look after you. I'm supposed to make sure you're okay. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch this. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. This is the very next verse. He says, I want you to work peacefully with all men as best you can and watch out for each other so that no root of bitterness grows up. Do you know the only reason you have bitterness in your life is because of a person? You can't get bitter at a tree. I mean, you might get bitter at a situation, but there's people involved in that situation. If there's a root of bitterness, that means you've got a problem with a person somewhere down the line. You know what a root of bitterness produces? A tree of bitterness with fruits of bitterness, which is anger and resentment and pride. We, we, we got we to pull this root up, y'all. The world is, if the church can't love people, who can? His, he says that all the law and prophets are on these two things, love God and love people. And I want to give you three ways, hopefully, that you can start working towards dealing with the offense in your life and start really forgiving some people who's, who's harmed you along the way. Now, Matthew chapter 24, he talks about the end of times. He said, this is what's going to happen at the end of times. He says, many shall be offended. This is toward the end. It's right before I come back. Many shall be offended. Now, I know they don't sound like us right now. Y'all, everybody, seven-year-old kids are offended these days. Just jacked up because somebody broke their iPhone. Seven-year-old with an iPhone is a problem. I'm just going to tell you. He says, many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Does that sound like the day that we're living in today? Jesus is coming soon. This is what we're living. He says, many shall be offended. Now, who is he talking about? Well, I'm going to tell you here in just a second. But I'm just telling you, we get offended. Uh, this week we were going to Oklahoma and then we decided to run up through Springfield. We went to the, there's an aquarium up there that's absolutely incredible, connected to the very first Bass Pro Shop. And so we spent about five or six hours there. And then we started heading down and we stopped in Jasper for the night and then we we're going to get up and go see some trails and go to Buffalo River and stuff. It was just me, Amy, and Kai, and, which is my life now. It's just me, Amy, and Kai. So I told Kai, we can get some steaks now. You know what I'm saying? Like we can. It's pretty exciting. But, so we stopped at McDonald's, and I asked my wife if I could tell this story, and she said, as long as you tell it right. So um, I thought that was hilarious. I busted out laughing. So if you tell it right, you can tell it. So here's my version of what happened. So we go to McDonald's, and I was like, yeah, I want anything. And, and so Amy says, yes, yeah, she wants a Coke, and Kai wanted a drink. And so I ordered me a sausage biscuit meal, and, and, which has a, a hash brown in it with a drink. And it... They hand it to us, and my wife opens the bag, and she opens it up, and she starts, I know the look in somebody's eye when they're about to eat something. Huh? She's about to eat my sausage biscuit. Now, I'm okay with taking a bite, but she's looking at it like she's about to eat this thing. So I got my drink. I handed Kai. The, he loves the hash browns. I gave him the hash brown on the back, and so she takes my biscuits. So I'm sitting there with no food. Kai's eating the hash brown. She's eating the biscuit, and I'm the one that ordered both of them. 
So I was like, you can have a bite if you want it. She was like, this is, I thought this was mine. I said, no, you ordered a Coke. And she said, no, I ordered a sausage biscuit. And she got offended. <laughs> she didn't think I listened to her. And then I got offended that she would think that I wouldn't listen to her. But you know what probably happened? She ordered a sausage biscuit, and I didn't hear her. And I was offended at the fact that she would think that I wouldn't listen to her. I always listen to my wife, everything that she says. <laughs> I will tell you about one time real quick, though. She sat on the couch, and it was, it was, it was like fourth and three. The Saints are driving. They're about to beat the Cardinals or somebody. And I think they got to kick a field goal or something. And she sits down, and she has a cell paper, and she opens it in front of me to show me the cell paper. Just slowly pushed it out of the way. We kicked the field goal. We won. Then I got to look at the cell paper. But that's usually when it happens. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Like it's the bottom of the knife, bases are loaded, and that's when the conversation gets serious. I'm going to tell this story real quick. I got to finish the McDonald's story in just a second. Let me tell you this. So I have two amazing son-in-laws. I got prayed over this morning during prayer time. If you can make 8.30 in the morning, it's incredible. Meet us in the hub at 8.30. It's awesome. They prayed over me, and one of the prayers was, God, thank you that he didn't lose two daughters. He gained two sons, and I did, and they're incredible. And so Anton, and I'm telling this story because they're not here this morning. What's up, Anton? He's probably watching online. So he comes. We go to Los Ponchos, and we're sitting there, and we're talking. And I know why he's there. Like, he's there to ask me if he can marry my daughter. So we're sitting there talking, and the Saints game is on. And I don't remember what game it was, but we were tied up. It's fourth down, we're on like the 15-yard line, and we're lining up to kick a field goal to win the game with three seconds left. And we're having this conversation, I'm like, great, he's, I know he's going to ask me, but he's going to wait a second. He starts asking me to pop the question, why they're lining up to, shoot the, to kick the field goal. And I'm not even facing the TV, y'all. <laughs> so I'm just like, yeah, man, I'm just stretching my, you can only stretch your neck so many times, you know what I'm saying? It's very obvious. But that's when those things happen. They come up when something serious is happening on TV. But my wife got offended at the McDonald's trip because she thought that I wasn't listening to her. And I got offended that she would even think that I wouldn't listen to her. And so she gave me the biscuit. I said, I ain't eating. And so I gave it back to her. She said, I ain't eating. And she gave it back to me. For about 27 miles, we passed the biscuit back and forth. Both offended that one wouldn't listen, and I was offended that she didn't even think that I wouldn't listen. So I finally went to the back seat, Kai threw it back in the front seat. <laughs> so after about, an, uh, probably, I don't know, 45 minutes of driving, we made it to our, our first destination in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and so Kai said, y'all really going to waste a good sausage biscuit? And nobody, I'm sad to say I got left in the car and we had to throw it away. <laughs> Offense wasted a very good sausage biscuit from McDonald's. See, I know that's kind of funny, but that can be a look. That could have been the end of our whole trip. Like, we could have been mad the rest of the time over a 99 cent sausage biscuit from McDonald's. They're good, but they ain't that good. Now, I might go to a fist fight over a Popeye's chicken sandwich, I'm just going to say, but not over a McDonald's sausage biscuit. But she was offended, and I know that she ordered it, and I didn't hear. All I heard was drink. I didn't hear the order, and she was mad at it. And it was incredible. We didn't even eat. Nobody got to be full on the biscuit because we were offended. And I'm telling you right now, that's happening every single day in our lives. We're supposed to be the fruit that, that, that people see of Jesus, and they can't see it because we're so jacked up at each other. We can't. Listen, churches are fighting. That's why I love the unity that's here. And I'm just telling you right now, we will, do, we will protect our unity at all costs. If that means me, I got to go, then that's what it means. If it means you got to go, that's what it means. We're gonna protect, I'm telling you right now, we will protect the unity of this church at all costs because there's anointing when there's unity. We're going to protect it, y'all. I'm just telling you, we're going to protect the, anointing, the, the unity because there's anointing. We got to be unified. Listen, if we can't be unified as a body, how are we going to reach a lost and dying world? We're not going to be able to. We got to be unified. He says they're going to hate one another. And then he says this, look at verse 11. Also, many false prophets shall rise up and deceive many. Because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Let me stop right here and tell you real quick who he's talking about here is the church. You know how I know that? Because this word for love is agape. The only place you can find agape is in the church of, of, of the Lord Jesus. It's unconditional love. You know what agape does? Agape love gives you the right to hurt me. 
want you to think about that for a second. If you really have unconditional agape love for somebody, you're giving them the right to hurt you and you won't be offended by it. That's powerful. He's talking to us. He's talking to the church. He says, because of the iniquity shall abound. That word for iniquity is a tendency. It's, it's the idea of some sins passed down from generation to generation that you haven't dealt with. And it's very important because he says, when you get offended, your love will turn cold. And let me just say it like this. Maybe, you, maybe this will help you remember if you want to write it down, take a picture or whatever. But this hopefully will help you not get offended. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. Love is suspended when we get offended. Love is suspended. It stops. Coldness tracks. It waxes cold. It's not effective. It, it stops where, it, where it's at. When you get offended, you cannot love God. And you cannot love people the way God wants you to. When you get offended, when we get offended, love is suspended. This is important. I'm telling you right now, there are people in your neighborhood waiting to see the love of Jesus, and they can't because you're too offended about something else that's happened. And you can't love them the way God wants you to love them. See, you can't be wax cold. You can't be cold to other people and be next to Jesus because Jesus is a consuming fire, the Bible says. You can't be cold to other people and be close to Jesus. It can't happen. So you're going to need three things. I want to give you these real quickly this morning. You're going to need three things if you're not going to be offended. If you're going to forgive people, live a life of forgiveness. Here's number one. You're going to have to have some fortitude. It's going to take some courage. You're going to have to work at this. It ain't going to happen on accident. It's going to happen because you meant to do it. It takes courage. So, so it's going to take some fortitude. It ain't going to be easy. Here's how we know this. Proverbs 18, 19 says, an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. Arguments separated friends, uh, arguments separate friends like gates, a gate locked with bars. I want you to get that. It's harder to win back than a fortified city when you have an offended friend. An offended friend, not an enemy, an offended friend is harder to win back than a fortified city. I'm telling you, we got to work at this. It's important. It's important. And all three of these points I'm going to give you come right out of Luke 17. Look at verse 3. It says this. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Let me just tell you real quick what rebuke means. It doesn't mean you bring them up in front of the church and you tell the whole world about what they did. It means you go to them and say, hey, man, what you did, man, that hurt my feelings. Hey, you said this, but I didn't really catch how you said it, and I really think you meant this, but maybe you meant that. I just want to clarify. That's what rebuke means. It means communicate. If you'll do two things, and I preach this in every wedding I'll ever do, and that's two, the two, Ten Commandments of, 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 of Relationships. It's communicate, 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 forgive, communicate, 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 and forgive. If you will do those two things, you will have a long and lasting marriage, and not just marriage, but friendships. Communicate and forgive. If somebody hurts you, talk to them about it. Don't just go tell the world about it. Don't put it on social media and call them a third party and only use their name and really call them out for something they did to you. Go to them. Social media is not the place for you to be to posting all your, the, the trash in your life. That's what it's become. That's not the place to do it. Go to them individually and say, hey, man, you said this, but I don't know really. You know how many problems would go away immediately because they didn't mean it the way you thought they meant it? And they didn't realize somebody was standing there when they said it, and they didn't mean for it to be that way, and it came out different. I've done that. Listen, I've said things, and as they're coming out of my mouth, I'm like, this sounds worse than I meant it to sound. I tell my wife all the time, I'll say something like, ooh, man, that's a little bit harsh. We got in a fight one time over candles. <laughs> because I said it, and I didn't, it came out harsh, and instead of fixing it, I just let it, like, oh, she'll get over it. That's not the way to, uh, this is, I'm not giving you marriage counseling this morning. That's not how you do it. I'm telling you right now, if we will, if it's going to take fortitude, you're going to have to work at it. Here's number two. If you're going to live an offenseless life, it's going to take forgiveness. You're going to have to walk in forgiveness. The next verse in Luke 17 says this. Look at verse 4. It says, even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and they come back saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Seven times in a day. And Jesus went on to say later, he says, if they, forgive, if they do it 70 times seven in a day, a person sinning against you 490 times in a single day and they come back and ask for forgiveness, you've got to forgive them. I know this ain't popular, and I know it ain't going to be easy. That's why it takes fortitude, but it also takes forgiveness. In fact, the Bible says we can't even worship when we don't have forgiveness. It says if you're presenting your sacrifice at the altar at the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, you leave your sacrifice. And it, back in those days, it was actually a live animal. You know, they had killed it. And if they don't go and do it right then and come back, it's going to spoil. So he's saying leave your sacrifice. Go and, and, and go and be reconciled to that person. 
I want you to notice in that previous verse it says, if they have something against you. Not if you have something against them. They got something against you. You go and make it right and come and offer your sacrifice to God. I'm just telling you, it's going to take a lifestyle of forgiveness. Here's number three, and this is one of the most important ones, and we've been talking about this, but it's going to take some faith. It's going to take fortitude. It ain't going to be easy. It's going to take some courage. It's going to take forgiveness, like truly, really forgiving, and it's going to take faith. It's going to take faith. This is so important. In fact, um, you know, there's only one time that we know of that, uh, that the disciples asked Jesus to, to, to increase their faith, and here's the context. Here's when it happened. We read this already, but I'll read it again. If they sin against you seven times a day, seven times they come back and say, repent, you must forgive them. And the apostles said, increase our faith. Jesus said, look, I want you to go out and heal people. I want you to go out two by twos and win the whole world to me. And they didn't say increase our faith. I want you to go and I want you to raise the dead. They didn't say increase our faith. I want you to go out and I want you to see broken bodies be healed. They didn't say increase our faith. I want you to see the lame walk and the blind see. They didn't say increase our faith. I want you to spend some time praying to me. Spend some time on your face before the Father. They didn't say increase our faith. He said, I want you to forgive 70 times 7 in a day. And they said, we're going to need some help with this one. If the disciples needed faith to do it, you're going to need faith to do it. I'm going to need faith to do it. Listen, the world is counting on us. We need to be in the presence of God, and you can't do it with a fence in your heart. In fact, the, the psalmist tells us that. It says, who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those who have hands and hearts that are pure and do not worship idols. I, I just I want to kind of close with this thought, this idea. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big sports fan. I love college football. I love baseball. Uh, I love college basketball. Um, man, I just, I love sports all around. I'm not a big hockey person, but soccer I can handle. But I'm just a big sports fan. And I think that what God is doing right now is he's removing some idols. Hmm. Some of us wake up on Sunday mornings and it ain't about, we ain't focused on church, we're focused on the 12 o'clock game. We're so wrapped up in our kids' sports that we can't even see straight. I think what God's doing is he's removing some idols, and we're worshiping. And we don't see them as idols, but that's what they are. And it ain't, it's not just sports. It's social media, and it's computers, and it's iPads, and it's TVs, and it's our kids. We're, we're focused on all these other things, and the world around us is dying. And we're so wrapped up in what we're doing that we can't even see that we're supposed to be reaching other people. Don't guard your heart, guard your heart, guard your heart, guard your heart, guard your heart. That word actually means to take into custody. You're responsible for your heart. I'm not. As your pastor, I want to help you. I want to guide you, but you're responsible for your heart. I'm not. You are. Guard your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of the issues of life. Everything that you do flows out of your heart. Guard your heart. The spirit of offense is running rampant. Will you be different? I want to make a difference. I'm tired of trying to make a point. I want to make a difference. I'm tired of trying to make a point. I want to make a difference. Let's make one together. Let's watch the world change when it sees the church change. And watch God do a work in our life.